Good morning, and welcome to our webinar on uh, U.S. real estate investing. And it's much broader than that, talking about the current state uh, of uh, uh, economic issues around the world and uh, the road ahead. We are very fortunate to have uh, a friend of mine and also uh, uh, an individual whom we are partners with on a, in a significant amount of real estate in the U.S., his name is John Faraci. He's the CEO of Ventera Realty. And Ventera has been doing um, real estate investing in the U.S. for almost 20 years. They now own uh, 60 separate buildings, 17,000 units, all focused on multifamily residential located in just six states, primarily in the south and southeast of the U.S. Uh, their returns over the last almost 20 years has been extraordinary at around 18.04% per year, or almost 8% a year higher than you would have earned in equity markets over that same period of time. Uh, John himself uh, has been recognized uh, in the past. He's not under 40 anymore, but he was a top 40 under 40 uh, winner, uh, member of YPO, member of the CEO organization, and uh, also Tiger 21. He holds an MBA from Harvard Business School and a Bachelor of Business Administration from Wilfrid Laurier University. And if you were to look at the reasons why John and his uh, uh, very significant team of 600 people, both here and in the US, have done so well, it comes down to uh, these additional factors. They're very focused on value add. Um, the, the geographic location of the um, assets is critical to what they do, as are the demographics factors such as household income, the economic potential of the region that they're in, a very, very disciplined buying approach and, and uh, management approach, and very high operational efficiency. So all of these things they have put into uh, a very sophisticated approach to managing U.S. real estate. Now, John has an interest beyond actually looking at real estate assets to invest in. He loves to take a look at macroeconomic picture, the picture and also the impact of geopolitical issues on how assets might perform. And it's with this framework in mind that John has agreed to join us today. So he's gonna focus at first at the high level 30,000 foot look at uh, the macroeconomic issues as specifically as it relates to the US, the impact on real estate. And then please, as, as was mentioned earlier, ask your questions as we go along. We have a, a lot for John at the end of this. He'll be around 30 minutes or so and then we'll have a reasonable, more than a reasonable time for Q&A. So John, if that, if, with that, if I can pass it over to you, uh, uh, it's all yours. Thank you, John, for those kind words. Let me just get myself set up here. Okay, <clears throat> so as John uh, indicated, in order to really talk about real estate, uh, first you've got to, at least the way we approach it, look at the big macroeconomic picture, look at the geopolitical issues, and out of that analysis falls uh, the answer to the pertinent question of real estate investing is where do you put your capital? So uh, going to start off, John gave me a question last week, uh, as you can see it on the screen here. Uh, the simple answer to which is uh, we think the U.S., we, well, we're very confident the U.S. is going to continue to excel economically versus all other major jurisdictions in the world, and I'll tell you why that we believe that to be the case. Um, we also believe that, um, and I don't want to be crass here, but this, the COVID-19 crisis has had a huge human impact and, and economic destruction. Uh, but once the dust settles, um, uh, I'll outline the reasoning why we believe uh, that the um, that COVID-19 has stirred up uh, a bipartisanship in the United States to repatriate manufacturing and build a US-centric supply chain that will represent the single largest economic opportunity for America since the shale revolution. So, you know, I grew up on the Canadian side of the US Canadian border, just outside of Buffalo in a small working class town. And uh, I became uh, a student of America at a very young age, you know, early teens. Uh, it was right around the time uh, where Watergate was going on. And the reason for that, is that Americans own like 95% of the waterfront property on Lake Erie where I, where I grew up. They all seem to be so wealthy. And I became fascinated with what made the American economic engine work. And interesting, since the, the 45 years that have transpired since I first became really interested in what drives the American economy, I've been told often, uh, mostly by Americans, 
uh, that America was in imminent decline, but it's been 45 years of imminent decline that's never happened. Uh, I am a Canadian. Uh, I'm passionate about being a Canadian and proud about being a Canadian, um, even though I do invest exclusively in the U.S. Um, uh, during that same 45 years that I've been analyzing uh, the U.S. market, uh, I've been told regularly by Canadians that Canada is a wonderful company, our country, full of economic potential, which I truly believe in. But the, the paradox of it is it's, it's full of potential. Uh, that hasn't yet been fully realized. Um, and, and that is the paradox, where America hasn't declined and a Canada hasn't realized its full potential. And uh, uh, we hope that it eventually will. I, you'll find that uh, what I really focus on is comparative information that is not generally available uh, when comparing the two countries or other countries to America. Uh, it, uh, I guess Americans don't are very insular. They don't compare themselves to other countries. And quite frankly, uh, other countries do not like to compare themselves to America because it really doesn't fit into the narrative of a, uh, certainly of a declining America. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, we expect that the there were some very well established trends over the last decade pre COVID nineteen, uh, and we expect that once the dust settles, and it's kind of like. Really, if everything works out perfectly, we've got 12 months of slugging ahead of us to get through this crisis. It could be 24 months. That's our best guess uh, in a directional manner. But once the dust settles, we think those trends that existed pre-COVID-19 will uh, reassert themselves often with more vigor than they had before the, uh, the crisis hit us. And really importantly, when you're looking at America from an economic perspective, and that's you know, what I'm really trying to get to, what is the economic uh, opportunity of investing in America? you have to realize that it is not a homogeneous country from an economic perspective. There are 50 different states and they each think they're different countries, 50 different countries. The governors in the US have incredible powers. There's 50 different Petri dishes of economic experimentation going on simultaneously in the US. Some of the states, quite frankly, don't have very promising futures. Um, some of the states are hitting it out of the park and will continue to do so. Uh, if you want to know uh, uh, the economic policies that will work or not work for Canada, they're playing out in real time south of the border. Uh, states like North and South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, Texas, among others, have been growing at 3% plus GDP on a regular basis before COVID-19, and they will do so after COVID-19 passes. Um, it's like, uh, uh, it's analogous to what I say it would be going back in time and investing in Canada in the decades that followed the Second World War, which were obviously very prosperous uh, decades uh, for Canada. States like New York, Connecticut, Illinois, Pennsylvania, they're struggling, they were struggling before COVID-19, they're going to struggle afterwards. And unfortunately, um, uh, from a certainly a big government perspective, Canada has followed those states and, and certain economic policies. The U.S. is going to emerge very strongly um, uh, following COVID-19 based on the strength of this first group of states uh, that will drag the overall American economy forward. But it is, from a comparison perspective, very important to, to zero on, on specific states to, to, to highlight those differences. So what are the economic truths about America? The reality is the 2010s were a golden uh, decade for America. You know, uh, what is the only major developed country uh, in the world that expanded its share of global GDP in, in the 2010s? It was America that went from 23% of GDP in 2010 to 25% of global GDP uh, in 2019. Uh, that just for perspective, that 25% of global GDP was the same share of global GDP that America had, America had in 1980. That's 40 years. Uh, have passed without any loss of global uh, uh, GDP. Now, the same can't be said of other major jurisdictions uh, in the world outside of China. Um, as you can see, Canada lost uh, about 20% of its uh, GDP share, uh, going from 25 to 2%. That would be the equivalent of America going from 25 to 20%, even though America were able, was able to hold it, uh, its share constant. And of course, most of uh, the GDP that was lost over that period of time by the various jurisdictions that are shown here went to China. 
Um, in the 2010s, the U.S. stock market increased by 2,000 or 250 percent. That's nearly four times uh, as much of an increase as the average stock markets in the rest of the world. In 2019, the U.S. Uh, stock market capitalization represented 56 percent of total global stock market capitalization versus 42 percent at the beginning of the last decade. And again, just for perspective, that 56 percent of global stock market capitalization represents a 100-year high for America on the global stage. Um, uh, and I probably don't have to say to tell you this, but if you just look uh, just before this presentation, I got these numbers for the end of June. So that for the 10-year returns for S&P 500 were 145 percent, and for the TSX were 21 percent. And Gallup Research, the the big polling firm since 1979 has been asking the question of Americans, are you satisfied with your life? Um, and the highest rating for that question ever was in January of 2020, when 90% of Americans said they were satisfied with their life, which is staggering. And then um, they also asked the question of, uh, since 1992, uh, are you better off now than you were four years ago? And again, the highest rating uh, for that uh, uh, question was in January 2020 when 60% of Americans said that they were better off than they were four years ago. Um, certainly before COVID-19 hit, uh, minority unemployment for uh, Hispanics and for African Americans, Americans were the low, was the lowest ever. Um, in fact, over the last three years, the bottom 50% of American income earners had their wages grow faster than the top 50%. Now, the economic truth about Canada. Uh, this is where I tend to be a skunk at a garden party. And as much as I love Canada, I love it enough to try to ring the bell and tell the truth. Um, so in the 2010s, in U.S. dollars, the per capita GDP growth in the U.S. was 34.5%. And during that same period of time, the per capita GDP growth in uh, Canada was negative 3%. So it actually went down. Um, if Canada, were, okay, so this, this is an interesting one. I, very few people have got it right. So I'm sort of giving you a, a clue to what the answer is. Uh, if you take the 50 US states and treat them as countries, and it's 50 different countries, and you put Canada into the mix, so you have 51 countries, and you rank them as number one being the highest US per capita GDP, and 51 being the lowest, where would Canada rank in that listing? Would it be in the top five? Uh, uh, countries? Would it be in the top 10, top 20? Well, it would be number 47. Uh, it would be ahead of Arkansas, Mississippi, uh, and West Virginia. And then I got in a, a discussion with a number of my uh, nieces uh, a, a little while ago, and they were saying about how difficult it was uh, as young people, they're all university educated, uh, getting established in their careers. And I said, yeah, I believe it feels different than when uh, I was a young person uh, in, you know, in Canada. Um, and I said, you know, gave me the idea to go back and see what it was like when I was a young kid, uh, getting my first jobs between uh, school years, uh, when I, 1977, when I was 16. And, uh, and I came up with this chart. So in 1977, at the bottom left-hand corner, uh, you'll see that, uh, uh, and again, this is, uh, uh, the gap was only, between per capita GDP and US dollars was only $579 between the US and Canada, the US being a little bit higher. Um, and it was different because certainly in Southern Ontario, you could get jobs in manufacturing facilities. Uh, unfortunately, in the, in the last two decades, uh, we've deindustrialized as a country faster than Italy has during that same period. And if you fast forward uh, over time to 2019, that gap in per capita GDP over the, uh, uh, following 42 years has grown to $15,209 uh, or 31.3%. And what's driving that is the bottom right hand corner. As you can see, the average uh, per capita GDP, nominal GDP growth uh, in each of the countries. So for 42 years, the US has posted GDP per capita growth uh, that's faster by 52 basis points, which are over half a percent. And when you compound that, over 42 years, it ends up being quite a large number. And then for young people, I looked at housing and how it was different from many of the people 
uh, that are on this call and uh, including myself, how much easier it was for us to get a handle on the, um, in the uh, a foot on the economic ladder of housing. Um, so this chart represents the multiple, multiple of the medium priced home in Toronto to the medium uh, household income. So multiple of housing prices versus income. How, much, how many years of income does it take to buy a house? And of course, this could be done for Vancouver, which I, I'm assuming a lot of people here are on, this, on this webinar are from Vancouver, and the numbers would be even more accentuated than Toronto, but directions are the same. So it only took two times median income to buy a house in Toronto in the 1970s, and then it went up to five uh, in uh, 2000s, and then it went up to 12 in 2019. And when I said it's when you invest in these markets that we're in, it's like rolling the clock back to the decades that followed the Second World War from an economic prosperity perspective. So this is what it's like for people in Houston. It's only a 3.2 multiple, and Houston is a huge city. It's seven to eight million people, a uh, very sophisticated city with lots of incredible amenities isn't as beautiful as Vancouver, to be honest with you, but very few places in the world are as, as, as beautiful as Vancouver. But anyways, it's, it's a lot easier to get a foot on the economic ladder. And then um, we may not have time to talk about this uh, uh, because I know there's gonna be a number of questions that John and other people are gonna wanna ask, but you cannot compare debt uh, levels in the U.S. Uh, versus Canada. The U.S. has something that's unique in the world, which is a reserve currency. Um, and Canada's um, uh, overall rating has been, for all practical purposes, been declining. So you look at some of the strong American companies like Johnson & Johnson, it costs less to insure their corporate debt uh, than it does to insure Canada sovereign debt. And I indicated to you that I really wanted to, uh, if, if you want to, get an understanding of what you're against. You don't compete as a country like Canada with America. You compete with Texas, you compete with North and South Carolina, you compete with Georgia and Tennessee and Florida, because that's where all the capital is going in America. It's where the employment is. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's really a tale of two different economic stories. And so what I wanted to do is just give uh, uh, some, some anchor points to give you a perspective how different the, the Texas economy is. And I could do this with any of the, uh, of the states that we invest in um, uh, uh, and some additional states beyond that as well. So Texas is now the 10th largest country in the world. And they do, believe me, think that they're a country. They, they surpassed Canada about uh, three or four years ago. Uh, and so Texas's overall economy has 5% higher GDP total. With a, and it's a staggering thought with only two thirds the size of the workforce. They're extremely productive in wealth and prosperity generating. The long-term productivity growth rate in Texas is two times uh, that of Canada. Um, in Texas, they have no personal income tax, no corporate, corporate income tax. And in fact, if a, a governor uh, gets elected in Texas, they're actually barred from raising the personal income tax above 0%. If they want to do it, they have to call a referendum and they get two thirds of the population to agree to increase the taxes above zero, which is practically going to be impossible. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. They, they, they've got a very aggressive attitude towards small government and actually forcing government to give up control to the marketplace. If you have a, a family of four earning $100,000 US, that family of four uh, in Texas will have $13,000 US more in after tax uh, dollars to spend on their family than they would in BC. And, uh, and so it's not a surprise that uh, the fertility rate or the family size uh, in Texas is much higher than it is in Canada. The median age in Texas is unbelievably six years younger than Canada. And there are proven peer reviewed economic models that, uh, that you can plug this data into. And just this age difference alone would result in a GDP uh, for Texas on an annual basis growing at 65 basis points faster. That, that's independent of all the other uh, the pro-growth policies that Texas implements. They don't do it on the back of uh, 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 inexpensive labor. In fact, Texas's real wage growth has been 50% higher over the last 20 years than the rest of, uh, when compared to the rest of America. And I, I know in Ontario, and I'm assuming it's the same in BC, uh, uh, people are very upset uh, in Ontario about the high cost of hydro or electricity. So what do you think uh, the uh, cents per kilowatt uh, it, it, uh, is charged to Texas residents for many nights during the year? Uh, how many cents per kilowatt do they get charged? 
zero. Um, they've got incredible numbers of windmills that have been built without government subsidy, using advantage of the wind that blows through at night, and they've got excess power they give away, basically. Um, Canada's fertility rate is uh, 1.5 children per woman over the average woman's lifetime. Uh, you know, Canada at its very root does not have economic problems. The economic problems are symptoms of demographic problems. We are not having enough children. That's the bottom line. You need 2.1 children per woman uh, over the average woman's lifetime in order to hold your population constant. If we didn't have immigration, our population in Canada would start to decline outright in the middle of this decade. Um, now, if you look at Texas, uh, its fertility rate, both with the people in Texas and the incredible amount of not immigration, just migration from other states. There's 350 people that move to Texas from other states on a net basis, 365 days of the year. Their effective fertility rate is 2.5, uh, which is like, again, a fertility rate that resembles what Canada looked like in the decades following the Second World War when the baby boom was going on. All right, so uh, on this slide, uh, John in his question also asked, how would America do in coming out of this uh, um, uh, economic crisis, COVID crisis uh, for other parts of the world? And I don't have a lot of time, uh, obviously. I've got, I'm restricted to 30 minutes here, so I'm gonna answer it with one slide. Uh, and it's the slide that I produced a couple years ago. Uh, some of the names have changed, some of the faces have changed, but the, the, the whole point that I'm making has stayed the same. So these are world leaders representing about, you know, just uh, under half of the world's population. Uh, you can see who they are. And the question I have is, how many children do you think that these world leaders have, not individually, but collectively? In total, how many children do they have? One. President Xi. Uh, now, if you look at the EU, uh, if you look at leaders representing 75% of the EU, EU's uh, GDP, and the EU's the largest trading bloc in the world, um, you know, how many uh, uh, children in total would those leaders have? Have zero, right? So uh, uh, again, we invest in jurisdictions that have pro-family uh, uh, policies that result in higher fertility rates that give uh, youth and uh, uh, an expanding population uh, uh, to an economy that becomes very, very vibrant. And, and for vast swaths of the world, this, the single largest or biggest economic issue uh, is that we have a lack of fertility, we have uh, fertility rates uh, declining precipitously around the world, and we have leaders for a big part of the country, or the, uh, the world economy, that don't have any connection to the next generation or the generation after that, i.e. their grandchildren, and uh, creating uh, family-friendly policies that create prosperity for the long-term art. It's not an easy thing to do, but we're fortunate enough to be investing in uh, those locations that actually do it. So uh, I do have some strong opinions, as you can probably understand by now, and I do have uh, some opinions on uh, how to view uh, things through an economic lens. And I believe that by far, there's a single uh, economic metric that is heads and shoulders above all other economic metrics uh, to be used as the lens in which to make investment decisions, whether within our own firm or buying individual properties, uh, or just basically um, uh, investing in general. So I've been called uh, a closet economist and I, uh, many times, and I'd like to say to any economists out there, uh, I, I realize that would be an insult to you. So uh, I am not an economist uh, by any stretch. Uh, I've probably taken a half dozen or so economic classes in my lifetime. And very early on in my early 20s, I came to the conclusion uh, that their, uh, uh, that long-term productivity growth was the lens with which uh, I would evaluate uh, uh, investment decisions and just business problems in general. Uh, not that everything else in economics is not uh, appropriate or important, it's just, in my opinion, a distant second. Making more with less, making it cheaper, making it faster, making it a higher quality, basically increasing the level of output for a given unit of input is the magical elixir, in my opinion, of prosperity and wealth generation, whether you're evaluating an individual, a family, a business, a city, a state, or a country, or a province. Um, and in order to drive long-term productivity growth, you must 
control the factors of production or of manufacturing. It's essential to achieving long-term productivity growth. And you better bet your bottom dollar that the Chinese administration is focused on long-term productivity growth of 20 years and 50 years. And any comments that I make about China today is really, you know, it's really focused on the Chinese administration. It's not the Chinese people. I don't want people to take it out of context in that regard. But here's something that's a vulnerability for America. It's also a vulnerability uh, for Canada. Canada does have a better education system, which is obviously a a hugely important thing than America, particularly at the K to 12 level. It's an incredible national strength of ours that we're not leveraging. Um, not that said, what I'm going to talk to you about here in America and its vulnerability is also a vulnerability for uh, Canada because Canada is much more like uh, the United States and these other countries that I'm going to indicate. So STEM. If you want long-term productivity growth, you need to have STEM. Science, technology, engineering, and math. And this chart shows uh, that China is graduating 4.7 million uh, STEM grads per year, India 2.6. That means that China is graduating eight times and India is graduating four and a half times the number of STEM uh, people, educated people, than America is. And that's a, a big concern. Uh, and I want to drill down just a little further within STEM. If you just look at uh, natural uh, science degrees, so that's uh, biology, chemistry, and physics, you can see where America stands in this in the unbelievably larger proportion of you know, uh, young intellectual talent that's dedicated to natural science in these countries. And if we just pick one country in particular, Singapore, uh, make no mistake about it, America is the largest, longest running economic success story in the history of mankind. But Singapore is probably the fastest economic success story. It is incredible what that country has been able to accomplish. In just two generations, they've gone from a a third world country to one of the richest countries in the world on a per capita GDP basis. They've done it without natural resources. They're on an island that's built on a swamp. Um, they've done it all in the back of STEM. And so um, the U.S. remains a net importer of high-tech products. And if America is going to realize uh, the opportunity is huge in front of it of repatriating its manufacturing uh, and creating an American-centric supply chain, it needs to do it at the high-tech level. Make no mistake about it that uh, both the China and America know the country that wins the tech war wins the economic war, and they end up having the strongest military. And you cannot do that without having uh, a, more, a, a bigger quantum of STEM in, in America and in Canada as well. Uh, I don't have a lot of time here, so uh, you know it depends on what we get to in, in the question uh, and answer period, but I'd be happy to answer why I believe that uh, the foundation of long-term economic prosperity, certainly one of the pillars of it, is small government. And I can explain what I mean by this point. And Canada does not have small government. It depends on how you measure. It's got about 50% more government on a per capita basis or per GDP unit of measurement, according to the OECD. Um, all right, so um, the, I told you what the most important economic metric is, and this is why we believe manufacturing is the most important industry sector. When I say manufacturing, it's not just traditional tangible you know, metal banging products, if you will, it's software, it's, uh, it's digital products, biomedical products. Uh, so it can be tangible or intangible products. And so um, why do we think that, um, uh, that manufacturing is so much more important than, say, service jobs? Uh, it's because there's a jobs multiplier of 1.4 additional jobs in the economy is created for every manufacturing jobs is created. And if you go into the really sophisticated, high-tech supply chain kind of products, uh, they create like a multiple of 10 jobs for every job that's created uh, in those sectors. And services only create 0.67 jobs for every service job created. I told you that long-term productivity growth, in our opinion, is the most important economic metric. What's the major input to long-term productivity growth? Well, it's R&D spending. And I do not buy into the thesis uh, when people say, well, employments are manufacturing just as a small portion of overall employment in America, it's only 9%. Well, that 9% of employment creates 77% of all private sector R&D spending in the US. And that big amount of R&D spending in manufacturing obviously drives productivity rates in manufacturing at two and a half times that of the service industry. 
uh, and exports. Of course, if you've got a widget, whether it's a digital or a tangible widget, you have the ability much more so than with services to export that around the world. And when you bring the profits back to your home jurisdiction, you make your home jurisdiction uh, obviously wealthier, more prosperous, that has more capital in which to reinvest. And then the rinse and wash cycle of creating wealth and prosperity just gets played over and over again. Um, and this to me is a staggering number in that if you strip out in America financial services companies, um, that 9% of employment in manufacturing represents 78% of corporate profits in America. And it is strategic, manufacturing is. And uh, probably no one on this call or very few people on this call experienced uh, World War II. Uh, but unfortunately, the problem of not studying history means we have to relearn things that our parents knew full well and our grandparents knew very well. And what our parents and grandparents knew was that America and Canada, and by the way, very proudly, Canada punched way above its weight in World War II. What they knew is that uh, the Allied forces, including America and Canada, would never have succeeded uh, in, in that uh, in, uh, history changing event of World War II if they did not have the factors of production within their control, if they weren't able to convert automotive uh, and manufacturing facilities to ammunition and tank factories, it would have been a different outcome in history. Because once manufacturing departs a country's shores, engineering follows, production know-how leaves, and then soon it's just a matter of, of the ability to innovate also goes away. And, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about a bit uh, about the disentanglement, if you will, between China and uh, the U.S. Uh, and uh, over the last two decades, there's been, ironically, there's been a lot of entanglement that has gone on uh, as trade relations were built over the last uh, two decades. And ironically, 50% of the overseas-backed R&D centers in China were actually established by U.S. companies. And that is no longer the case, going to be the case, which I think is a good thing. Um, all right, so if you, th there's two very important graphs here that really help conceptualize the opportunity that lies ahead for America and its allies. And uh, Boston Consulting Group, what well-respected uh, consulting organization, does an annual survey on uh, manufacturing cost competitiveness globally, and they index the U.S. at 100. In fact, just for the reasons I've mentioned already, they don't index the U.S. at 100. They don't even take a lot of states into consideration. They only focus on Southern United States because that's where almost all uh, manufacturing capital flows to uh, in the states nowadays. So it's at 100. China index is most recently at 96. And so they've got a four point cost advantage, but it's important to understand that during the last decade, the states has become incredibly, the Southern states more cost effective in manufacturing with the shale revolution, with the liberalization of labor laws in the Southern states, um, you know, China has actually creeped up consistently here in, in costs and as the gap has closed and they've done, China's uh, uh, creeped up with a depreciating currency versus the U.S., which makes the U.S.'s accomplishments so much incredible. Their, their doll has been a bull market for a number of years here. And if you look at Mexico, Mexico is at index at 86. And so the, the real important point here is that if there's obviously a relationship that exists, a formal relationship uh, from a trading perspective, actually July 1, it just the new uh, uh, USMCA went into place that connects in, in a more intricate way, uh, Mexico and the United States. But you combine those two countries and uh, it gives America the ability to go uh, up against China from a manufacturing perspective and beat them on a full range value of manufactured goods and services uh, in the global marketplace. This chart, oh, it's something that's different that's important. Uh, so if you look at manufactured products in China that get exported to the US, only 4% of the components of those exported Chinese products to America include American made components. But if you look at that uh, uh, paradigm through Mexico, manufactured products that are exported from Mexico to America have 35% of the components actually originally made uh, in the United States. And so what this point says is that yes, it's very important for America's sake that they gain market share globally in manufacturing from China. But in a derivative manner, they also win if Mexico wins because a large portion of the components in, 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 in those manufactured products in Mexico that are exported have American components in them. And that's why uh, as, as uh, proud as I've been and as much as I've benefited from the relationship between Canada uh, and the US over the years, 
um, we are going to increasingly be fighting for a share of mind uh, with uh, the U.S. as it relates to Mexico, because I think increasingly, because of this battle with China, means a renewed friendship with Mexico. And I will almost assure you that the kind of derogatory language that was used in the last election cycle towards Mexico will not be used towards them uh, in this election cycle, regardless of whoever wins the presidency, because uh, Mexico has uh, taken center stage in America's future to take on China. Okay, so what is the future of the China-US relationship? Uh, I will tell you it's not very good and there is no reconciliation. It's a battle between two separate and incompatible ideologies. On the one hand, you have uh, uh, an ideology in China that's based on uh, personal domination and centralized control. And in America, as you know, it's about liberty and personal freedom. It's just degrees of friction and adversarialness. Uh, uh, but there's no reconciliation there. And you're going to think that I'm somewhat off my rocker to say that there's green shoots of American bipartisanship in the political spectrum uh, today. Uh, and if you watch cable news, you'll think I'm really crazy. But I really do believe that there is. Because um, I think there's finally bipartisanship uh, to support a major strategic initiative to undo the mistakes of the past uh, in terms of building uh, an American-centric supply chain. When you have Elizabeth Warren, who represents the left wing of the Democratic Party, criticizing President Trump for being too soft on China, that really sounds like the foundation to build uh, bipartisanship uh, between the Democrats and the Republicans to bring back manufacturing. And make no mistake about it, the disruptive potential of Americans seeing that uh, during COVID-19 crisis, 80% of their pharmaceutical ingredients being produced offshore, 97% of their antibiotics. And then at the nadar of the crisis and the lockdown, President Xi of China threatening to withhold personal protective equipment from Americans. That sense of American vulnerability was not lost on either the Democrats, the Republicans, or the public at large. Um, if you thought it was rough to date with between America and China, Hold on to your hats because it's going to get rougher and the elbows are going to get sharper. Um, and the reason for that is the repatriation of manufacturing is no longer just a trade issue. It's no longer just a political or an economic issue, but it's now being viewed as a national security issue by Americans, which means that both Republicans and Democrats uh, are going to support whomever is in the White House in this next administration to go really tough against China. And when I mean getting tough, it could include actual trade barricades with China, formal bans on capital flowing from America to China, bans on Chinese asset purchases in America, sanctions on inputs into Chinese industries and companies like Huawei. Now, uh, I'm going to mention a few vulnerabilities for both China and for the U.S. Um, Make no mistake about it. I believe that it would be a, a great, you know, a really poor, poor judgment to underestimate the capabilities of China. Uh, they're a very worthy adversary uh, for America. Uh, at the same time, they do have some relatively large piece, uh, points of vulnerability, and I do believe, on a net basis, significantly more vulnerabilities uh, of, of large magnitudes than America has. As, as strong as China has become. So first of all, demographics. Uh, America has great demographics for a large country. One of the best, uh, uh, youngest uh, population bases uh, and has an immigration tap. So uh, that is still the land of opportunity that immigrants want to go to, whether they're invited to or not. Uh, uh, but uh, China has terrible demographics. They're getting older faster than they're getting richer. Uh, they're now older than America, believe it or not, on average, even though they're a developing country. Um, their working age population, which is critical for a vibrant economy, is already in outright decline. Their total population will um, start to decline somewhere into the 30, 2030s, which obviously isn't that far away. I've seen some demographic studies that show that by 2050, there'll be 150 single adult Chinese males for every 100 single adult females. And that has all kinds of social, political, and economic consequences to it as well. And China has been able to achieve an incredible amount of, um, uh, of uh, economic prosperity over the last uh, uh, two decades. But it's been all based on an import-export model, i.e. getting products from uh, different parts of the world. 
uh, to different other parts of the world. And that is based on freedom of the seas. And those freedom of the seas, ironically, has been provided by the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy is about three times as powerful than the projected power of the rest of the navies in the world combined. Um, and uh, China is dependent on foreign oil. They depend on Middle East oil. Their navy is short range oriented. It, uh, it's really focused on capturing uh, Taiwan and they don't have any effective way of patrolling the Straits of Hormuz to ensure steady flow of oil. And uh, at, from an agriculture uh, perspective or uh, food, they don't have food cell sufficiencies. They uh, plowed over a lot of the great farmland they have to build factories. Uh, per unit output of uh, agricultural products, they require five times the amount of inputs of insecticides, pesticides, fertilizers that are largely imported. Um, and you know, don't forget, in the history of uh, civilization, more um, uh, more regimes have fallen uh, because of problems with food logistics or food production than they have because of wars. Um, and so, the last point here I'm going to make, and then I'll wrap it up here, uh, is America's vulnerability. So I say. Um, the opportunity of creating an American-centric supply chain uh, is a huge opportunity. Uh, their, uh, America's vulnerabilities are in minerals, where China has been able to cobble together essential monopolies on critical minerals, which are essential for inputs to uh, uh, technology products. So there's 35 minerals uh, that have been identified as critical to American uh, uh, national interest and national security. Uh, 14 of those minerals, however, over the years, uh, America has allowed itself to be 100% dependent on uh, imports for, uh, for its own personal consumptions. Things like rare earths, uh, where China has got a worldwide monopoly on. Uh, 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 minerals like lithium and cobalt, uh, where America does have some production in it, but they are heavily reliant on, on foreign sources. And these things are used for energy, technology, steel, batteries, research. A large number of Chinese mining companies have um, or SOEs or state-owned enterprises are aggressively investing overseas and getting control uh, of these minerals. The U.S. relies on China for one-third of its consumption of five of these 14 minerals, on which America is 100% dependent on imports for. It relies on 50% or more for three of these minerals, and for seven of the minerals, China is the world's largest producer. That's a focal point that America needs to address. Uh, if it's going to end up creating its own American-centric supply chain, particularly at the high end uh, of, of the food chain. I'm, I, I told John I would stop at 30 minutes, so I'm going to stop. So this is a slide that uh, I, I wanted to ask, uh, pe uh, let people ask me a question of, like I ask one question of the following people or entities, uh, what would that question be? But we'll skip that. Maybe we'll get to it in the Q&A. Uh, and if we don't, we don't. So uh, I am going to take it off of you, John, now. And I am, uh, there you go. Okay, so let's open it up to Q and A. Thanks, John. That was, <coughs> a, that was great, fantastic stuff. And since you weren't able to get to all of that last slide, let me at least ask you: What is the question you would put to President Trump? Oh, that was, that's a simple one. Um, it'd be with such a phenomenal economic track record that his administration has been able to create. Uh, you know, why are you trying so hard to lose an election? that should be yours uh, with so many forced errors. The discussion point should be, can I carry 44 or 45 states, not how far you are behind Joe Biden? And I'm sure if I asked that question, he would ignore it. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, on the assumption that he's capable of understanding the question. That would be maybe the point that maybe many okay. Canadians would try to make. Let, let's let's um, not get too nasty, John. <laughs> no, well, I, I'm trying not to, yeah. No four letter words in, it will be thrown in here. Um, but you know, it sort of segues into something that probably does resonate with Canadian. And as they think about investing more, let's say in the US, you're certainly making a compelling case why that should be done. But how do you respond to the issue of the relative long-term dysfunction of US federal government itself and, and the, the, you know, the Congress and, and obviously uh, the administration uh, over the years and, and sort of sidebar to that, uh, the the level of um, challenges in race relations and, and violence in the U.S. and that impact on your investment decisions. Just curious where you're coming from there. Um, okay, so uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a tough question. So the, the reality, I'll, I'll go back to something that Warren Buffett said, and, and uh, as opposed to commenting on individuals, uh, presidents, he said his comment was, America is so strong with the sense of checks and balances. And I've given a presentation that you've seen, um, uh, John, before 
uh, the 13 structural reasons why America has uh, uh, you know, structural advantages versus other countries. And uh, the reality is, um, you know, it, it's, it's sad that at least in America, and I think in Canada as well, that we are, as voters, whether in, 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 in both countries, I, and I think we both have issues, uh, we have to make a choice between economic com uh, competence, which I believe we have, combined with, say, belligerence, or economic incompetence with social grace. My uh, first political science course uh, and uh, the, that I had taken the first class with the, uh, it, was a, it was a role for lawyers, so Canadian University, what the professor said was make no mistake about it, uh, that the Canadian prime minister with the majority government is far more powerful than the American president is within the four walls of the respective countries. Internationally, of course, the American president carries a lot of weight. And so, uh, uh, you know, you would never have a government in, in, in the States. I think they'd be storming the White House with pitchforks and torches uh, if a government were to say, we want to have unlimited tax and spending powers, uh, like happened here. Now, obviously, it didn't get implemented here. So uh, I know that things are more confrontational in the States, uh, but we, what my concern is uh, uh, with Canada right now, and I do believe that small government is the way to prosperity. Like I said, all these Petri dishes that exist mm -hmm. and uh, in the States, and you can see the States that have large government orientations and the ones that don't. And uh, those are the ones that win. And I'm afraid we don't have an effective right wing or fiscal conservative uh, uh, representation in the government structure right now in Canada. So, you know, on that point, and this is why it concerns me, and it goes back to the point of small, uh, of small government, uh, and it's important. So uh, the BLS, which is the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it, uh, 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 you know, it measures productivity of ever, almost everyone in the States. They stopped measuring productivity, which I think is the most important metric, as I mentioned, uh, a, a while ago. Uh, uh, they stopped measuring productivity of themselves, the government. And so Deloitte came in and said, you know, we, we, uh, it's too important not to know the difference between the productivity growth rates of uh, the private versus the public sector. And so they did a study between uh, 1987 and 2012, so a 25 year period. And what they determined was in America's private sector, um, uh, productivity, was growing at 1.6% per year, pretty healthy. In the public sector during that same 25 years, uh, productivity in the public sector was declining 0.6% per year. They were getting worse every year. And so there's a certain point after which, you know, roads and bridges and the military and hospitals, those are all things, these are the common goods that any advanced society should have. Uh, and they, 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 there's some things that government does do a better job at. I'm not a libertarian. But we are so far past that point that we're choking out the productivity growth that comes with a larger private sector. And that's where I think Canada really needs to focus on, as opposed to, you know, uh, uh, the bombasticness of, say, that it goes on south of the border. The, the, what I do like about, I don't like the abrasiveness sometimes that happens in the political spectrum because it's dysfunctional at times, but boy, do they get the issues on the table. I, I feel that it's very, very frustrating that the CBC or the electorate uh, is not informed in Canada of, of what is happening long term. People are getting less happy um, uh, over time. If you look at the, the, the happiness indexes in Vancouver or in Toronto, it's, they're great cities for people who have money. They're not great cities for people that don't have a lot of money. Uh, whereas, you know, places like Houston, you can have a, a couple, a two-income couple, each making $40,000 a year, and they can have a nice house, and they've got lots of economic opportunities. So, yes, I can get, I, I'm trying to get sidetracked with all the noise that goes on uh, on cable news and, and really try to focus on what has to happen in Canada from what I see in the U.S. So that's my most poli uh, politically correct way of Ask no problem. Question. Well, I mean, <clears throat> we're going to stay with the macro issues for at least another five or 10 minutes and then drill down into the, into how this impacts real estate. But um, it's that segues into an interesting question, which would be this. How do you see the economic recovery coming out of COVID, both in Canada and the U.S., V-shaped, extended, uh, uh, flatlining? I mean, wh what are your expectations for recovery in both countries? Yeah. Sure. So um, 
uh, I would say that uh, it hasn't changed since the first lockdown happened. And so we told our investors as soon as uh, like somewhere in the middle of March, that it wasn't going to be a, a, a V, a U, or an L, or whatever, or a W. It was going to be a, a successive number of U's, with the bottom of each U and the top of each U getting higher in a slow fashion over the following two years. Uh, and that was our call back then. It's our call now. Unemployment is not snapping uh, back uh, in a fashion that's indicative of a quick recovery. Uh, at least that's our perspective. And in talking with uh, some pretty high level people in the US running huge institutions, uh, having access to capital flows. It's their estimate that there's about $5 trillion of capital now sitting on the sidelines, waiting for the opportunity to invest in America across both public and private markets. So there's a lot of capital sitting there, but they're kind of frozen uh, because central banks are, are, are squeezing them out right now. Um, here's a staggering stat that uh, around the world, central banks are spending $2 billion per hour buying financial assets. And that's, again, forcing the private sector out. Like, we're having trouble trying to get price discovery ourselves and figuring out where the real economy is because you've got this liquidity that's being artificially put into the system. Um, I think the real damage is yet to be felt because capital projects are being delayed or abandoned. Um, and uh, companies are doing that to, to build up stronger balance sheets. Uh, and I think that is going to result in employment being more static than the public markets are anticipating. So I think there's a little more pain to come. Uh, companies are continuing to fire employees, at least in the States. I don't follow the Canadian market as closely as you know, but every day there's major companies doing major layoffs. Um, I think we've experienced the, the largest collection, uh, uh, collective wishful thinking in my business and investment life. We've got the stock market telling us that everything's okay and the COVID-19 COVID was just a scratch uh, on our flesh as opposed to a gaping neck wound. We think it's more of a gaping neck wound. Uh, politicians are cheerleaders, that's their job. Uh, and of course, we're suckers for good news. And uh, I, I think uh, that the worst, uh, there's some bad, uh, you know, no one really knows at this point exactly. What I will tell you, is that um, I'm not going to give a specific prediction. What I, uh, uh, if you look at the the financial crisis of 08-09, uh, the worst year was 09, and it had a GDP decline of two and a half percent. Any way that we look at the U.S. economy is that that number is going to be worse in 2020, a factor of two, maybe even three. So it's going to be at least a five percent decline in GDP. Uh, unemployment that was at its worst in 2009 at 9.9%. It's going to be worse this time around in 2020. It'll be low teens. Um, you know, and, and then you know, there's a lot of socializing of losses that are going on now. It doesn't make it feel as bad as it really is. And how long can the government go on and socialize these losses? We think they'll go on until November, even though legal or right now the law only allows the socialization until the end of July. But uh, both the Republicans and Democrats want to get elected, so I think they'll socialize it for a bit longer, but uh, uh, we've got some tough times and some reckoning after November. Okay, so John, I mean, connected to that, you've got all of this quantitative easing on a global basis. You talk about the, the buying of financial assets, as, uh, which would tend to, if you will, support the market, making, let's say, currently where the S&P 500 is questionable at, at best. But you have had a history of talking about expectations of uh, low inflation and low interest rates as a secular change, not a short-term issue cyclical that you didn't historically believe in that. Yet usually, you know, when you create a lot of new capital and new money, that tends to be inflationary. So uh, what are your expectations for inflation and interest rates over, they say, anywhere from the medium to longer term as a result of where we are today? Okay, so um, uh, we were uh, uh, strong believers. In fact, we put it in writing five, four years ago, even though right after the financial crisis, we said this changes a lot. It's different this time. And that we are going to be in a lower for longer from an interest rate and inflation perspective, as far as the eye could see. Uh, that was back in, in 2010 and 2011. And then because our opinion was so contrary, uh, we were asked by some investors to do a document on it. And we did about four years ago called Lower for Longer. And it was when Jamie Dimon, the 10-year treasury was above 3%, and Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan was saying it's going to go over 4%. And we said that, it will, that the 10-year treasury uh, will not go above 
3%, even though it was above 3% at the time, uh, for any contiguous six month period for the next five years. And of course that bet is still in the money. And why is that? Um, it's because of demographics that I mentioned. We have got, I mean, there's 25 countries in the world right now that are having outright population declines. There's one country getting added every year to that approximately. Um, we have, anytime, if you go back 2000 years, you'll see that anytime you have demographics that remotely resemble what we've got going on now, most of it's been famines and, and wars in the past, it's hugely deflationary. And so that's one reason. The other reason, is that if you uh, look at what happened, uh, it caused the markets to capitulate in 2008 and nine. It was because of too much debt. And what did too, what did too much debt look like back then? Well, if you took worldwide uh, debt divided by worldwide GDP back then, it was a ratio of 269%. And the whole purpose of the financial crisis was to deliver. Uh, but now that ratio is 318%. It's gone from 216, so 269% to 318%. Um, we just moved things around to different sources in terms of the debt, the uh, debt puzzles. We have more, and the only reason the market hadn't capitulated before COVID-19 was because carrying costs were too low. And then third, um, uh, COVID's gonna accentuate this. We have been digitizing our economy at the fastest rate in history. And what happens? Uh, uh, when you digitize something, when you spend a lot of money up front to create this first digital process or product, and then it costs nothing after that. Uh, so the unit one costs a lot, unit two costs almost nothing. And you can make as many of the units as you want with no additional costs or very little additional costs. Here's a deflationary. COVID-19 put, has put all of those trends you know, on steroids, if you will. People are not gonna be having more babies because of COVID-19. Their financial security has been threatened. Uh, and uh, so that trend of a lack of fertility around the world will get accentuated. Debt for sure has gotten worse. And uh, the reckoning of delevering is gonna be very deflationary. And as we know, the whole technology piece uh, that was aggressively being pursued before COVID-19, it's gonna be, uh, companies are gonna put so much more effort into digitizing to be able to work remotely and just have less friction in business. And the bigger companies, are going to end up winning more. So uh, the answer is, I don't think there's, put it this way, if there's long-term, there could be some short-term blips here or there, like there's gonna be more sovereign defaults. There was one in Argentina last month. I believe there's gonna be more happening. There could be some, some, some uh, interest rate, maybe some inflationary blips in other parts of the world, uh, but long-term trend, uh, I, you know, if, if there's any long-term inflationary pressures, I'm a blind man, I don't see it. Okay, so, you talked at the end of your presentation, you sort of about China's and, and the US's vulnerabilities. Um, so it's sort of implied there that you see China's uh, future to be um, relatively smaller than maybe most other in, uh, economists might have said. That it, it, it has always been assumed that China, not just on a purchasing power parity basis, but on a real economic basis, would become the world's largest economy and uh, and potentially its most powerful military power. So yes. is it safe to say that you would disagree with both? Uh, yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, from a, a military power perspective, I, <laughs> I, uh, it's not gonna happen, right? Um, uh, uh, you know, China, you, you, you don't go to war with a lot of people carrying canes. They're getting so old uh, so quickly that their ability to become belligerent is going to be very difficult. And if you look at, um, you know, where they are, in, in, you know, in the Asia Pacific area, they, they're hemmed in by a group of islands with very strong militaries and and, uh, uh, and navies like uh, South Korea and uh, Japan and the Philippines. So, uh, and then America is like literally oceans away. So the answer is, I do not see. Uh, I'm not saying that they're not a threat. Uh, uh, militarily, but I don't think there's going to be military dominance. And quite frankly, when you get past this period of, of President Trump and his uh, foreign policy belligerence towards allies, um, you know there there is a zero percent chance that a Germany, a France, or a, a, a Britain is ever going to align themselves with China uh, over America. It's just not going to happen. And um, you know, <laughs> uh, 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 I just, uh, China could not have behaved 
again, not the Chinese people, it's the Chinese administration. They were craving, craving was part of their strategy to have an alternative world reserve currency, uh, you know, prior to COVID-19. And they couldn't have done more to ruin those chances. Who is going to back China now when they behaved so terribly as a world citizen, right? They, I, you know, I don't know, I have the facts. I don't think they caused the, the, the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic purposely. It was caught, it was started there, but I don't think it was intentional. But what we do know is that they uh, did not let the rest of the world know what they knew when they knew it. And that caused lives, uh, cost lives, and it caused great economic damage. They, um, they stopped flights out of Wuhan to the rest of China. Uh, but they allowed flights from Wuhan to the rest of the world to continue for quite some time. And then when the global community wanted to uh, do their own research to verify how this uh, virus escaped, China has blunted their efforts. So um, that ruins their, uh, uh, their ability to build trading relationships. It, builds, it hurts their ability to be reliant, uh, to be relied on as a financial uh, uh, foundational piece for the global economy. Uh, and just militarily, that's just uh, their dominance is just not in the cards. Great. Well, okay. So, John, let's move a little bit to the US Canada relationship and looking at it economically and then looking at it from an investment perspective. So, let's start with um, a view of currencies. What, what's your thinking about the US Canadian exchange rate? Okay. So, here's what I uh, maybe what I could do here is uh, let me go and share again. Uh, this is an interesting topic. Uh, uh, so let me just try to get this moving here. Okay, so here we go. So, uh, you know, interesting, I, uh, 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 if, if the viewers here find uh, the US uh, Canadian dollar exchange question an, an emotional one, you would not be alone, uh, but it shouldn't be emotional. It should be obviously, you know, an analytical and economic based. And the reason I say that is that I remember I had a, uh, a discussion with one of our investors, and he was in his, uh, you know, his mid to late, they call it late 50s, and he manages a very successful family's uh, family office. They're about $350 million of capital they invest. And he had been investing consistently with us. He still invests with us, uh, about a million, a million and a half dollars US per deal that we do. And then uh, I confirmed with him that was he into this next deal, and he said, Well, yeah, I am, but I'm going to go for 250000 I said, Well, if you don't mind me asking, why so? Uh, why so little? I mean, it's fine, but uh, it's just it's it's not consistent with your previous pattern. He goes, well, I just I uh, you know I don't have uh, that much um, U.S. dollars available to me right now. And I will, before I do any kind of, I'd rather have some U.S. dollars come in than do an exchange. And I said, well, you know, it's kind of interesting because you know uh, you're worth 350 million. How much do you, if you don't mind me asking, how much do you have of your portfolio in U.S. dollars? He said, you know, five percent. It's 5%. I mean, you're not using this $350 million to buy groceries. Uh, it should be more professionally allocated. And, um, and he says, yeah, I get it. And I, I walked him through this chart. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's instructive. And so what this chart shows is one of our standard deals. Say it's a 14% IRR. Uh, that's in blue. And that's in American dollars. So, you know, we invest in American dollars. We give American dollars back to our investors. Um, and the red line uh, is the IRR if you are a Canadian who has bad fortune. So you invest in this 14% US IRR deal, and the day after you invest in the deal, the Canadian dollar goes up in value versus the US dollar by 15%. Not going to happen. And for sure, you're not going to see large swings ever in the Canadian US dollar uh, on an annual basis exchange rate like 10% per year, year on, uh, year on year, because one of the countries would be bankrupt, and that's not gonna happen on either side of the border. And so the, the point here is that uh, if you trade in and out, exchange rates become very important if you're a trader. We're not in the business of trading. We look really hard for assets. We buy less than 1% of what we look at, um, and when we buy it, we hold it for long periods of time. That's the game we're in. Therefore, it was not a trade. If you were to look at what the value of your asset was, if that exchange rate, uh, uh, Canadian dollar went up by 15% and stayed there for the rest of the 10 years, your holdings would be hurt quite a bit in the first couple of years. But if you held it for its duration of 10 years, that 14% IRR would turn into a 12. It's down, but it's not down that much. And well, I always say to everyone, 
look at where you're going to invest first. Where are you going to get the highest risk adjusted rate of return? Uh, and mm -hmm. as long as it's not a third world country, uh, sorry, not a third world, but a developing country uh, that has volatile exchange rates and volatile economies, and you're making investments for the long term, the exchange rate really shouldn't be something that you're considering. Do you actually have, though, a, an opinion about what you would see as sort of the the maybe the secular trend in terms of yeah. currencies or are we sort of in in the range where we are now at whatever 75 cents yeah. Yeah. which is is that purchasing power parity more or less close uh, what do you think yeah so uh i'm certainly not uh, it's not my area of expertise but long term i think it's it, it's it's plausible to put a a, a, you know, a scenario together that would make sense so uh what got this investor of ours over the hump is he asked exactly that question mm -hmm. um and, and uh i and i said to him listen i i again i'm not a currency exchange uh, expert but what i will tell you if you have one country the america growing its per capita GDP, i.e. probably the best proxy for wealth generation that exists, uh, at 52 basis points faster than Canada's per year mm -hmm. for, for the last 42 years, it is highly unlikely that the secular trend would favor an appreciating Canadian dollar over time. Okay, it, I, so I think it's going to be a stronger, you know, you, you can't have one country growing economically that much stronger and then have its currency depreciating that much more, unless its fiscal house is so bad in order, which it's really hard to measure the, the U.S.'s fiscal house because it does have the reserve currency of the world, and it's not an apples to apples comparison with Canada's debt. Okay, so now I just want to talk to the audience at large. Uh, basically, we are in a situation where we would normally be wrapping up in about six or seven minutes, but we have 15 questions from you already as a group, and uh, I haven't got through the ones I wanted to deal with, John. So what we're gonna do, John, if you're good, is to go to 2.30, uh, our yep. specific time, that's uh, another 20 yep. minutes. If you can't stay, don't worry about it. This will be recorded, so, and it will be, uh, you can uh, look at it at any point in time. So in the future, if you've missed the last 15 minutes, no concerns, just you can pick them up at a later time. So um, let me, let me go to some of the questions that have been posed here because they're still dealing with some of these macro issues that we talked about. Sure. Um, so this one is from uh, Kenny Lee and he says, do you believe the US will experience the law of diminishing returns? They are only one country with uh, the expanding share of global GDP. So the expansion cannot keep expanding, if you will, at the same rate. In other words, they can't keep going from 25 to 27 to 30. So is there, Right. Some plateau we hit here uh, in your oh, terms yeah. of your expectations? Oh, sure. I, I think it's sort of hit, right? Like, um, uh, because you've got other countries like, that's a great question. Uh, it doesn't mean that the U.S. is losing its edge. It's just that when you have other countries like India, which I think has great potential, um, you know, uh, Mexico has great potential. It's got some major things that have to change. You know, the Philippines, Vietnam, they're going to, those countries are going to gain market share, mm -hmm. right? And, yeah. and so uh, uh, my concern is that, uh, and maybe this, we're, I'll, I'll take a little bit of liberty with this, this question. Uh, my concern is not so much uh, uh, if the U.S. can hold on to its 25% or, or it goes down to 24%. The, the thing is with those U.S. allies, because I think most of the countries I mentioned are U.S. allies, with the U.S. as a partner, you can do well. With China as your partner, you can't do that well. Um, and so uh, I think there's broad swaths of, uh, of the world that are uninvestable. I think Europe is uninvestable. Uh, I, I think China is uninvestable. Uh, I think the U.S. is highly investable. So uh, to, to answer your viewer's question, yes, they could lose market share, uh, uh, global GDP basis, but I think that America is such an overwhelmingly positive place for capital around the world. Like I said, there's $5 trillion. This is from CEOs of major U.S. banks that are drawing this conclusion of capital that's going to go into America. I, um, I, I think it's, you know, it, 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 it's going to have a very, very promising future. So when people ask me the question, though, know, maybe this is what's at it, how much should I invest in Canada? How much should I invest in America? I like to ask, answer it by how much you should invest in America. As a Canadian, of course, I've got literally all my, my, my discretionary capital in America, except for one to two years worth of spending money. That's okay, so, so, so that's a great segue, John. I mean, 
Okay, in your case, it is your business to, you know, you, you run as a Canadian an American business. And so, yep. and that business uh, puts your capital in the US and it, that's, that's logical yep. for what you're doing. But let's say you're a passive investor in Canada and I don't know, you're talking to your in-laws or I assume, I assume you do talk to your in-laws and that you can, <laughs> that you can, um, uh, you know, they're saying, okay, well, John, what should I do? You know, I mean, we've got $3 million and we're retired on it. And, and, and your first question or their first question to you is, well, what percentage of these assets do you think John should be in Canada versus let's say in this case, the U S and, and what would you tell them? Yeah. So, uh, the simple answer is 50% in the U S at a minimum. Okay. And, All right. and, and how do I get to that number? I get to that number uh, because 50%, if you look at all the major sectors, over 50% of the world's venture capital originates in the States. Over 50% of the world's private equity investment originates in the States. If you look at the S&P global stock market index of 11,000 publicly traded stocks, over 11 business sectors, over 50 developed and developing countries, in 10 of the 11 categories, the U.S. has over 50% market capitalization in subsectors like software that are very important, it's 86%. The only area where it has lower amount is in materials, i.e. minerals, which I talked about, they're at about mm -hmm. 30%. So all that comes to be together to say that it should be at least 50% in the U.S. I believe more, but I think there's a strong logic that at minimum, as a Canadian, it should be 50% in the U.S. Okay, fair enough. And we have a question from Rob Lucy. He's asking this question, and it has some extensions to it, and also coming back to the currency issue. But he asks, how should we evolve to a non-oil gas world? And maybe I can just add to that question. So, A, we're making an assumption we are going to evolve to a non-gas oil world, so maybe you can really comment on that yep. and because we clearly are a major oil producing country it would be nice depending on your conclusion here to suggest the impact that would have economically and maybe from a currency based perspective on Canada in particular oh boy okay so I love Canada and it pains me uh, to see what's what's going on and I'm getting I'm not an expert in it but uh, first of all the big picture and we have big investments in Texas, big investments in, in, in Houston, among other states. So while we're not energy experts, we do follow it relatively closely. And uh, opinions are all over the map, but based on the experts that we've talked to, we conclude that there is, um, there is no non-oil world out there in the foreseeable future, okay? So there will be demand. The problem is that I, you know, I think there could there could be decreasing demand, but there will be demand. Locations like the Permian Basin, who has just been incredibly naturally endowed with light, sweet crude that they can get out of the ground at twenty five bucks a barrel, and then the free market, you know, uh, economy in Texas allowed them in two thousand and nineteen to actually build and put into production three pipelines in two thousand and nineteen for natural gas and oil between the Permian Basin and uh, Basin and Corpus Christi. That's uh, that's what you're up against. So uh, I think, and I'm just so you know, from a, a personal bias, I'm a strong believer. I'm a right wing tree hugger. Uh, climate change is real, and we we've, we've had our head in the sand. And so I would love to see uh, an oilless world, a car, you know, a carbonless world. Not going to happen. Uh, just was at a con I spent uh, a couple of days at a conference at Harvard with just the week before the COVID uh, uh, crisis hit, and we had a really well-respected engineer, uh, a geologist from Harvard, said he really, really wants to see a, you know, an oilless world. And Harvard's under a lot of pressure to to, to uninvest in carbon. And he says it's just not going to happen uh, because the, the the world will not tolerate what that looks like. Um, so I, I think it's really really important, given the structural disadvantages of our of our oil uh, resources, the cost structure of them, our inability to get the product to market, the Canada start diversifying. Uh, um, uh, so I'm I'm not overly optimistic with this current government, and that I wish. Uh, if they were, if their plan was to leave the oil in the ground, they should have stated that up front uh, and, and just said, we're not taking it. But we had all these procedures and processes going on. I think it was very unfair to the people of Alberta. Uh, so uh, uh, you'll be surprised to know that Texas is the single by a long shot largest producer of, uh, of renewable uh, uh, energy. 
by far the largest in wind and the third largest state uh, in solar. Um, uh, so they're going, they win in either direction. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, I, with Canada, uh, what do I, what, uh, I think there's going to be demand for the oil. I just don't see a way of getting it out of the ground with the current focus and uh, okay. uh, getting it to market. Well, let's segue into some of the specifics as it relates to real estate. So I, we, keep me in mind, our focus today is on the U.S. and real estate in particular. Um, so, so one question, this is from me, um, related to the impact of COVID. So now I'm looking for the immediate and uh, short term, six months, 12 months, whatever, impact on real estate, but broken down. So if you can break it down by major asset categories. So retail, office, industrial, residential. So in those four categories, what do you see both the immediate and let's say very short to medium term impact that COVID is going to have uh, on, with respect to U.S. real estate in particular? Okay, so I'm going to, this, this could take up the whole president really <laughs> quickly because um, uh, obviously we, we're limited on time here. So uh, I, I can't remember the order you gave, but what I will tell you is that the darling before COVID-19 was industrial. The darling after COVID-19 will be industrial. It's, okay. um, uh, it, it's, just, it's got all the trends working in its favor. The biggest concern, excuse me, I have about industrial is flow of capital. So um, uh, you've got uh, 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 an industry it's a, or a sector that's about half the size in the U.S. of multifamily, and it's attracting a lot of capital. So, uh, but it, its prospects are, are, are great. Uh, its returns, I think, going forward, if you, you want to get cut to the chase on that, uh, over 10 years, if you're underwriting right now, you're probably going to see about a 13% return, which I anchor against multifamily, which is, I, I also think it's about a 13% IRO over, 13, over the next 10 uh, years. Help me, with, help me with this, John. I don't want, need to interrupt you, but sure. okay, there is, there is um, classically, it, with real estate, as much as there is with any other kind of assets and investments, there's alpha and there's yep. beta. Basically, beta is the market. So I understand what you believe you can do in that space because you do add value. And But let's say I just wanted to say, okay, I'm going to buy the index equivalent of let's say an industrial portfolio in the U.S. in some ETF or REIT or something like that. Now, do you still think we're looking at thirteen percent, or is it going to oh. be some? <laughs> Absolutely some not. Okay, so, so <laughs> let's talk, let's just first talk about the market, and then talk about what value add could bring to the equation. Yeah, yeah. So uh, private versus public. All right. I mean, I'm obviously I've got almost all my capital. Uh, in, in private markets. And just a really quick aside, a great story by, uh, 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 that I have with uh, one of our investors who manages money for a billionaire out of Florida. And uh, this billionaire doesn't have one publicly traded stock or, 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 or bond. And he has a great explanation for it. He said, well, he said, uh, I'm a billionaire and I, I buy you know, high yielding private investments and that's my cash flow. And he said, uh, fundamentally, uh, the difference between private and public markets. In the private market, I can keep doing my due diligence until I have essentially perfect information that no one else has. If I did that in the private markets, it's not an advantage, it's going to jail because you can't have that kind of advantage. And so, as you said, there's value add. Um, and so, um, uh, uh, you know, I see, I, I don't see a world where, you know, if it's, even if it's public REITs, you know, exceeding 10%, maybe right. high single digits. Uh, and so and if you look at, at least in, in America, I don't know what the stats are in Canada, that, you know, in the last 20 years, the number of publicly traded companies has gone down from 7,500 to like 3,500. It's gone down more than half. During yeah. that same period of time, you've had the number of analysts go up by 11% per year. So I think you're, so you're that's looking a reverse at productivity. Is that what you're trying to tell yeah, me? Yeah, exactly. So you've got probably at, at least I'd say a three to 400 basis point uh, differential between public stocks investing and private, assuming that the private stock investing is at the top tier of the market, right? There's a huge variance. Uh, there, there's this old saying, uh, you know, uh, caveat, uh, legal caveat uh, in investing. Uh, you know, past performance is no uh, guarantee of future performance. But there's been, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a change to that, as long, except for in venture capital and private equity. Because what's been proven over the last 20 years is the top 10% of performers tend to stay in the top 10% because they have 
the discipline to in an investment platform to deliver, whereas the ones in the bottoms tend to stay in the bottom. So if yeah. I'm talking about the top tier of private equity, the top tier of venture capital, they can outperform the public markets by three to four hundred percent. Or right, three or so, four basis points, I should say. So you have these relatively good value add returns in uh, residential and and um, industrial. What are your thoughts about office and retail? Yeah, so office, uh, there's some really smart people that are saying that office will uh, benefit uh, from this, i.e. social distancing will require more square footage per person. Uh, I'm not an office expert, but I don't believe that. Uh, in any uh, CEO that I've talked to, and I do talk to many, <laughs> no one at this point with battered balance sheets uh, are thinking about in the next couple of years of expanding the footprint, right? They're thinking of, um, of, of essentially, um, uh, 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 you know, having people work from home and uh, you know, uh, automating their processes. People aren't looking to add more space. I think office in the central business districts is going to be um, uh, difficult for the next five years. You know, there's a survey that was done in Toronto. It may not be as bad in, in, in Vancouver, but in, in Toronto, the second biggest cause of stress for Torontonians after bereavement, i.e. the loss of a loved one, is commuting, right? So, um, okay. I think right. I, so. I, I, I think that uh, the, the the central business district office space is going to be hurting. I think within an overall contracting market, suburban office space could do better. Uh, if I use my anchor point as multifamily, because I know it very well at a thirteen percent IRR, me personally, I would not be investing in office, uh, you know, for less than a sixteen percent IRR over a ten-year period. Just because right, there's there's more unknowns. But let's go back to, let's go back on both office and retail. Coming back to the, if we have sort of a beta return, let's call it a market return um, <clears throat> without much value add in, in residential and industrial of let's say eight to 9% a year, let's say over 10 years, as you've suggested, <clears throat> in comparison to that, what might the expectations then be for office and retail when compared, just market returns? Uh, so here's, you're, you're calling just the public market returns? Yeah, basically, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So instead, essentially, you're essentially it's, <clears throat> think of a very passive approach to those assets. It's not the return. It's not the approach you would take. Uh, okay. You, okay. Right. It's the passive approach. <laughs> then whatever multifamily is, it, you, you know, it's the opposite of what I just said. You're gonna if if if, if multifamily is eight, nine, 10% in the public markets, uh, passive invested, then office is gonna be less by, you know, a couple, 100, 200 basis points from that. Okay, and then retail worse than that, right? Yeah, and it, yes, it, it is. Uh, like, well, the way I look at the, the categories you talked about, there's uh, industrial and multifamily clustered as one and two respectively, a close cluster, a big drop off to number three, which is office. Yeah. And then, uh, which is number three, and then, then comes retail and then comes lodging. And so retail is, 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 is broad. So I actually like neighborhood retail, like services, um, you know, strip malls type thing that have right. a lot okay. of density around them. And, and those are service oriented uh, clients uh, that are uh, somewhat Amazon resistant, not Amazon proof, you know, nail salons, you know, barber shops, uh, restaurants, uh, uh, pubs, they've tattoo all been parlors. decimated. What's that? Sorry. Tattoo parlors. Yeah, no, sure. No. They, they, oh, they, they, they're big too. Um, okay. But you, uh, uh, the reality is, uh, they've all been decimated. But they've been decimated short term. They absolutely will come back. So I like that kind of retail. That kind of retail. If 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 multifamily is, you know, uh, eight, nine, ten, it's it's like office. It's 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 maybe seven or eight or something like that or six. Okay, seven, eight. so um, and in all cases. And in all cases, um, I mean, the real critical difference is to make this work really properly, it's that's your base that you get to work from, it's your foundation, but and then it's what you do with it. This is the value add issue that drives each of these outcomes. And that's where that difference of three, 400 basis points per year is gonna come from. It's really what the, the way that those assets are required and the way they're managed and uh, upgraded and improved, correct? It's absolutely that. It, it, for sure, it's everything that you said. It's also, I believe, it's wholesale versus retail, right? So yeah. we, you know, we're spending, we've got an acquisition team that's approaching 20 people and uh, uh, they do nothing but look at deals. So we look at, you know, probably this year we'll look at 800 deals and do 
half a dozen to eight or whatever. And uh, it's, it's that discernment that helps us find where there's value add, which is very difficult. The, the private markets are getting more perfect, but they're far less perfect than the public markets. And that allows, if you buy well, and then you operate well, that's what in combination right. will generate your three to 400 basis points of extra return. So Dave Schellenberg has asked the question, which I think is really interesting, coming back to these macro issues in the US. So he said, he asked this, how does Southern US states keep cost competitiveness advantage with respect to labor supply and skills training? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it's, it's, it's free market, right? Like the, um, uh, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's an incredible difference. Like BC has 2.6 times the amount of per capita government that uh, the Texas has. Uh, and these, these states are putting in at the local college level, significant, significant uh, apprenticeship programs uh, and training programs. And, and their universities are tied into industry in a way that, because there's a lot of industry that say Canadian businesses are not tied in with our industry. So, um, uh, and the level of automation, the aggressiveness of deploying technology is making uh, them more cost competitive per year. The, the productivity growth rates, i.e. Uh, producing more with less, is faster there than wage growth. So they're, they're, they're getting positive drops from that perspective. Um, from a, you know, it's hard to explain, but trust me when I say this, it is almost going to be impossible to compete with the Southern United States, certainly Texas for sure, um, on energy intensive manufacturing. I mean, they're getting you know, oil out of the Permian Basin at 20, 25 bucks a barrel. Natural gas is virtually almost free. Um, they've got a, an exploding, that the, the productivity out of the Permian Basin has basically ensured that, um, uh, 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 that employment in oil extraction will never be what it was. Uh, the Probably the peak employment we believe is 2014. They just keep getting more with less. But we also recognize that when we talk to all the experts, there's actually growth in downstream value add, which is where they're moving, in petrochemical manufacturing. We believe there's 10 to 50 times the number of jobs that are being created in the southern states on, around petrochemical manufacturing, which the US is the world's leader in right now, um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to offset the, the, the displacement and the efficiency gained in, in energy. And um, renewable energy is taking off like crazy there. And the cost structure, I just saw in, uh, I think it was either in Nevada or in Arizona where they got, the, they're going to have the, one of the world's largest solar uh, uh, facilities and it's going to have a full cycle life co uh, cost of 1.5 cents per, uh, uh, per kilowatt or some, something crazy like that. So. Um, the, the, here's the point, is that the difference with these states is they're focused on winning. And you, that almost all the governors in these states are extremely business oriented. Let me give you an example. I talked to someone I know who uh, runs a global manufacturing business out of Canada, and there's not that many, so I gotta be careful what I say here, but it's big, like it, it's in 20 different countries, and he's in a number of states. And he uh, opened up uh, a manufacturing facility in either Georgia or South Carolina. And within the first um, uh, year uh, of being down there, he got a call from the governor. And the governor said, hey, you know, uh, uh, Joe, his name's not Joe, uh, I want to invite you to the, uh, the governor's mansion for dinner. And he goes to the governor's mansion and the governor says, you know, really glad to have you here. Uh, I hope we're doing everything we can for you because we love you know, having you, uh, you know, in either Georgia or, or South Carolina, he goes, is there anything I can do to convince you to bring more of those Canadian plants down here? Um, and, and my friend, the guy I was talking to says, this is the difference. You know, I have never been approached by the prime minister about my manufacturing investment in Canada. I've never been approached by the premier because I've never been approached, and this is a multi-billion dollar company, by my MP. They fight to win down there and it creates uh, an environment where the, uh, the people who are really, the, the states that are really focused and the governors that are focused on it ensure the attraction of uh, investment capital like nowhere else in the world and that drives their productivity and drives their opportunities. I have 
you know, it's scary how competitive the Southern states has become. I'm not concerned about their competitiveness at all. They're going in the right okay. direction. Okay. Now, John, we have, uh, we're, now we're still a little bit over, but we have I want time for one more question. And then there's still a bunch of questions that we haven't got to, but um, I'll work with John and we'll figure out a way to get some responses that we can then uh, post on our website or send to the um, attendees that have been here tonight in one way, shape or form. But I think this is a kind of a pertinent question and maybe not a bad way to wrap up. So um, number one, uh, the first part of the question is, do you expect the Democrats to basically get um, uh, both levels of, uh, uh, of uh, the, uh, the House and the Senate and the White House? And if they did, what does that likely mean for both the U.S. economy and U.S. tax rates? Yeah, really good question. First of all, I don't know, and I'm not a political expert. Uh, if I had to guess, and I've gotten this wrong a lot of times, so you know, it's worth what you're paying for. Um, uh, so I do not think it'll be a sweep. I don't. I think the, I think the Republicans will hold on to the Senate, I, and I hope they do, because I think that would be uh, uh, beneficial. Um, the Democrats winning uh, would not be good for the U.S. economy if Joe Biden continues with business as usual. And what I mean by that is that the Obama administration, from my perspective, uh, was you know good on a diplomat. He, when President Obama spoke, he didn't ever have to worry about him saying something offensive. That's for sure. But economically. It was not a good administration, and um, Joe Biden was part of uh, part of that, obviously. And um, as Thomas Friedman said, who is a well-known uh, Pulitzer Prize-winning author, uh, journalist for the New York Times, uh, said, and, and a, a, obviously a, a, a Democrat, said that as much as Trump can be derided, it took Donald Trump. And in Thomas Friedman's world, it was words were. He was the only one on the Republicans or the Democrats that was had the, 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 the ability, the courage, whatever you want to call it, to ring the bell on China. And according to Thomas Friedman, the bell was long overdue to be rung on China. So now it's rung. The Democrats are saying you know, the same things that the Republicans are. My concern is that part of Joe Biden's platform is to raise the corporate tax rate to 21 to 28 percent. That is exactly the wrong thing to do. Don't play with corporate tax rates. Capital is mobile. Uh, and, it, and, and if you start fooling around with it every time the administration changes, now people don't make investments in putting a new factory in a location when they know, when they feel that the administration can change that tax rate at, at a wins, you know, every four years. That would be really bad, really, really bad. The thing is that you know, Joe Biden has a lot of, of Democrats uh, that are successful business people advising them. I'm hoping, and I think, that that was something to appease the left wing of his party. And when he gets in office, he'll need to be focused on taking on China. And the screams will be very loud from the business community that if you do that, you're putting one hand behind our back. So my guess is that won't happen. My guess is the Republicans will hold on to the, the Senate. And my guess and my hope, which is a bad strategy, is they won't increase the corporate tax rate. They will likely need to, there's almost a, if the Democrats get in, there's like a, almost a 100% chance that the, the, the personal tax rate will increase, but that won't, um, that won't necessarily impact the U.S. economy as negatively as the corporate tax rate increase would. All right. Well, listen, John, we, we could just, we could easily go on for another hour, no problem at all. And We'll get back to you with these sort of unanswered questions. That would be great to get your thoughts on them. But first, I want to thank you. It's been fascinating uh, to hear your thoughts on this. And you have this amazing long-term track record. So, you know, you're, you, you, as they say, you can walk the talk. And we really appreciate the, the, the ideas that you've given us today. And I think it'll give a lot of people here room to think about not only their asset allocation, but also their country allocation when it comes the future investing. So with that, just our, our, our great thanks, John. Well, thank you very much for the time. And uh, I do, I'm a, I'm a Canadian, I'm a big believer. We will realize the potential eventually in this great country. All thank right, well, thanks, John. And thanks everyone okay. else. And we'll be following up with the additional questions soon. Thanks again.